Today we'll hear about how to fight a future pandemic as well as short and long-term consequences of COVID-19. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Galea. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's a privilege to be here with you. So um, I, um, I'm going to talk about COVID, which we've all been talking about constantly for the past uh, uh, two years. And uh, my job is, as I see it, is to try to give you a bit of a set of ways to organize one's thinking about COVID and uh, really recognizing, um, uh, broadly speaking, the, the, uh, what you're all engaged with professionally and trying to give you a way to think about COVID and to look ahead in COVID in a way that might be useful to you, might be useful to you in your professional engagement. And you know, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then uh, just to leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure that you have all sorts of questions that um, will be helpful for you just post questions and I'll do my best to answer. So having said that, I'll plunge right in. You know, I'll start with this, which is where do we stand? So we're two years into um, the COVID pandemic and um, since uh, the emergency declaration was on March 13th of uh, 2020, first case of COVID was um, detected in uh, December 31st of 2019. It's actually hard to remember that uh, before December 31st, 2019, none of us had actually ever heard the term COVID, like those letters didn't exist before. And you know, we've been through a lot since. So let's start with cases. This is a, um, the epidemic curve that goes um, um, in terms of COVID cases. And of course, as I'm gonna talk about in a second, we have to be very careful about thinking about the epidemic curve and what implications it had for the severity of COVID among us. So the last bump here, which is the big bump, of course, is Omicron, which um, as uh, everybody here knows, was a much milder form of the virus. So although we're looking at the epidemic curve, which is dominated by the last curve, which is Omicron, that of course does not reflect um, uh, where the severity of COVID was at and where our worry about COVID was at. When you look at um, uh, COVID positivity rate over time, you actually see that COVID positivity has actually been going down quite a bit um, uh, since we started this year. And when you look at um, deaths, which of course should reflect potentially much more realistically what we should be worried about or not, you see it's a quite a different pattern than was the case patterns that I showed you before. So the deaths actually were highest when we had um, the um, wave towards the end of 2020. This is, the, this is the Delta wave and then this is Omicron. And the people who were affected by COVID were of course quite different. The people who actually were dying here were pretty well exclusively people who were unvaccinated. So, it's a, so there has been quite a different pattern and nature of what we're seeing in terms of cases as cases match on to deaths. And I think that's an important part of our nuanced understanding of what's happened in COVID, which is sometimes different than what one gleans when you look at the paper and you simply look at the sort of the COVID ticker, you know, which goes up or down the way the stock market goes up and down. But just the same way as the stock market going up or down doesn't necessarily mean the same thing for individual stocks. Similarly, with COVID going up or down, it doesn't mean the same thing for who is actually getting COVID and how severe COVID has been. The um, COVID fatality rate has also been going down over time, um, uh, which means that, uh, and what that means is simply that uh, out of the people who actually get COVID, the proportion of people who actually end up dying has been going down, and it's been going down right from the very beginning of COVID consistently. At the end of the day, I'll point out that um, this is here, it's about 1.2%, you see? So we're now at about 1% COVID. Um, many of us thought that we're gonna end up with about 1% fatality rate of COVID all the way back in 2020. Um, uh, if you go back to the media, you'll see sort of people are saying 5%, 10%. That was always, um, um, I thought, uh, far overblown. 1% um, is probably where we're gonna end up. Just to give people a sense of grounding as to what that means, SARS had about a 10% um, fatality rate overall. Something like MERS, which never really made it out of the Middle East, has about a 30% fatality. Ebola had about a 40% fatality. So just to give a sense of um, COVID fatality. So COVID fatality overall is actually relatively low compared to some of these other viruses that caused epidemics in parts of the world ever since. Now that's good news or bad news, depending on your perspective. It's good news because, well, it's good news, it's low. It's bad news if, as I come back to the end, you recognize that the world probably will have other pandemics and there's no guarantee that the next pandemic will actually not have a higher case fatality rate. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. So that's where we are in terms of cases and deaths. Now let me talk about vaccinations. Let's talk about where we're at in vaccinations. And vaccinations in uh, this country are very much a glass half full, glass half empty story. And depending, I think the way you look at vaccines is very much a test of whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. So let's, let's look at the numbers. 
about 200 million people have been fully vaccinated in the country, um, uh, with about 95 million people receiving a booster dose. That's the numbers here. These are the latest CDC numbers, and you see them right here. Um, you know, you can, uh, again, you say it's a country of 300 plus million people, 200 million people fully vaccinated is not that many, or you can say, it's actually pretty remarkable that we've vaccinated that many people in such a short period of time. Um, you know, just to put it in context, we have never, like never, as a country, tried a mass vaccination of adults of this scale. Like, it's just never been done. We've done mass vaccination of children, and when you go to polio, you know, often polio is brought up as an example, and we say, well, polio was a success. Well, actually, if you look carefully, it took us two years to even get to a level of vaccination of children we wanted with polio. And we actually got pretty far in COVID in the span of about a year. Now, this is who received at least one dose and who's fully vaccinated. So at least one dose is on the left, fully vaccinated is on the right. I mean, 95% of people, 65 and up, have received at least one dose. Again, you can look at that and say, why can't we have 100%? Or you can look at that and say, I don't know, 95% of people are getting at least one dose. That's pretty good, right? So, so I, I really think it depends very much on one's perspective. I mean, these are the data. 95% of people have received at least one dose. Over the age of 65, 88% of people have received at least two doses. Now, just like the um, overall curve doesn't tell the full picture, there's tremendous heterogeneity behind it. There's tremendous heterogeneity behind who is getting vaccinated. So this looks at the national picture. So these are the national picture about who's getting vaccinated. The green is more vaccine. The brown is less vaccine. And uh, what you see is there's quite a bit of national heterogeneity. Of course, as you all know, that heterogeneity also reflects the political map of the country with the blue country and the red country with quite different patterns of uh, COVID vaccination, which is why we've had such different patterns of cases over time in terms of COVID because Omicron, as I mentioned earlier, affected people broadly who were unvaccinated and people who were unvaccinated broadly we're here in the country, in the middle of the country, which broadly is red America. So I think it's important to us to recognize that while you know, I'm talking national trends here, these national trends do break down when you actually start looking carefully at what's happening regionally and different pictures are emerging regionally. Now this is the actual main vaccine, the first two shots. Things get much harder to be optimistic about when you get to things like boosters. So when you look at the booster, this is the percent of people who've received boosters. And the high end of this scale, by the way, is 30%. So now we're dealing with, before I was dealing with the zero to 100, now I'm showing you the zero to 30. So boosters have really had very limited uptake. And what, what that tells me, and I think it's relevant to you all in the room, is that barring some dramatic shift, we're unlikely to get much more uptake as we do further and further shots. So like if we're actually going to be relying on needing people to get more shots, we're not gonna get very far because the boosters showed very, are showing very clear. There's an enormous gap. And if you look at, I'm not showing you the, to you here, the rate of uptake of boosters has actually been going down even more. So quite a big difference between the first wave of vaccinating people and then the boosters. And then one more thing that's very important about vaccines is that paradoxically, the people who could benefit most from vaccines are the people who are least likely to have received vaccines. So what does the way to read this graph is this. These are each bubble is a county and the different size bubble is a different size county in the US. The top row are people living in the most vulnerable counties. There's an index called the social vulnerability index, which essentially looks at underlying disease and things like that. So this is the most vulnerable counties. This is the least vulnerable counties. And the line looks at the average, the average vaccination. Among the third of Americans living in the most vulnerable counties, average vaccination is about 57%. Among the third of Americans living in the least vulnerable counties, average vaccination is about 65%. So some of you may know there's something called an inverse care law. This was came up with 50 years ago by Julian Tudor Hart. The inverse care law said, says that care is, there's more care received by those who need it least. And that's exactly what we saw in this country, that the people who actually need the vaccines the least are the ones who are more likely to get a vaccine. Conversely, those who need the most are the ones who are least likely to get a vaccine. Now that of course has implications, right? It has implications for the burden of disease, that if we actually could match who got the vaccines with those who need it, we would have less morbidity, but that's not what has happened. So that's vaccines. Now let me talk about variants because variants has dominated a lot of our thinking. So I'll start with, uh, this is a map of where the variants are sort of, of the um, evolution of variants. So we started with epsilon, alpha, there, there are variants which you probably haven't heard of like iota, gamma, beta, mu. Um, Delta, which was a big variant, and then Omicron, which started 
at the end of uh, 2021 and uh, carried us through the first couple of months of this year. Now, just a couple of notes about variants. First of all, variants are common with these viruses. All sorts of viruses have variants. That's why there's a different flu shot every year. It's because we've got different variants. There's nothing particularly exceptional about variants because I realize a lot of things that we've been talking about about COVID um, make it sound like these are new things. They actually are not. The fact that there's been variants in terms of um, the, the coronavirus that is COVID is entirely normal. That's what these viruses always do. A couple of other things about it. It is almost always the case that for something like um, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus behind, um, uh, behind COVID, subsequent variants are less severe than the variants that have come before. The reason is actually very straightforward because the virus has fewer people it can transmit itself to. So it needs to be more transmissible. And to be more transmissible, you can't be actually then killing your host. So actually, biologically, evolutionarily, subsequent variants are typically less severe than prior variants. Now, that does not mean that there are not exceptions. So one of the questions which I imagine is on your mind, you've all been reading about the um, BA2 variant that's now um, um, spreading in Europe, it came from Asia, now spreading in Europe. The, the, all evidence suggests that that variant is a milder variant even than Omicron. Now, that does not mean that if we're testing for it, we're not going to see a spike in cases. I'm here to tell you, I mean, there's very little I'm going to predict for you because anybody who predicts is sort of a, going to be wrong, but I'm here to predict that the next month there's going to be another spike in cases. How we deal with the spike in cases depends entirely on how we see the cases. They are going to be largely mild cases. The people who are going to be more affected from a severity point of view are people who have not been vaccinated. Now, does that mean that we as a world say we want to go back to mandatory masking, universal masking? Does that mean that we as a world are going to say that we want to go back to distancing? I mean, that's not a, that's not a scientific question. That actually is a, a political social question about the level of risk that we're willing to take. But the spike in cases is going to happen. It's going to be mild. And we collectively need to decide how we want to approach that. Now, the business of predicting variants is, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult science. The only reason I'm showing you the slide is just to show you sort of what we know and what we don't know. And uh, you don't have to read this, but the things on the left are things that we study in science. The things on the right are things we don't study in science because we actually don't see it. Things like fold change per countries, um, how the mutations spread, et cetera. So whenever we're, the science of predicting when mutations are happening and uh, how they're spreading is really imperfect. And anytime you, you, you look at this, you know, there's, there's such a strong human impulse to say, well, we want to know what's going to happen next. And it's actually very difficult to know what's going to happen next. We are excellent at sci in science at explaining what has happened. We are terrible at predicting what's about to happen. And I would encourage you all to take any such predictions with a real grain of salt, because there's a lot that actually we don't know. Um, um, one more slide to actually show this. This actually looks at each of these squares looks at the prediction of a particular variant versus what actually happened. And what you, all I want you to see here is the, you look at the solid lines versus the dotted lines. And you see how the solid lines and dotted lines are actually different in um, um, each of the squares. That's simply to show that for every variant that we've had, our prediction of where spread is going to be has been different than um, what actually has happened. I mean, sometimes not that different, but it's always been different. The one thing we do know is this. This is the epi scores of the COVID Omicron variant, which shows the rate of mutation. So the rate of mutations actually of um, Omicron, uh, of uh, COVID, sorry, are increasing. So the rate, of, the, the rate of mutations is increasing. That means there are going to be more variants. Now, why is that? Again, evolutionarily, it makes all the sense in the world, right? Because actually, we have developed immunity against other forms, against other strains, other variants. So actually, we've developed immunity. So the virus is mutating more rapidly as it tries to find ways to keep itself alive. So there's, there's nothing surprising there. There's nothing surprising there. There's nothing surprising about the fact there will be more variants and nothing surprising about the fact that most of these variants will actually end up being milder than the previous variants. Can there be an exception? Yes, there can be an exception. I'm here to tell you that, you know, can tomorrow all of a sudden a new variant emerge that's actually dramatically different or perhaps more severe? Yes, it's possible, but it's certainly not what we would expect. Okay, so that's where we were. Now let's talk about the consequences of COVID, which is, uh, I think, fundamentally what occupies us all. And let me start with physical health consequences. So the physical health consequences of COVID have been bad. I mean, COVID's been bad. It's, uh, you know, it's, we're getting close to having a million Americans who have died from COVID, about another 5 million people died around the world. Um, uh, COVID 
was the third leading cause of death in 2020. That's COVID right there, right behind heart disease and cancer. And you know, we're sitting here two years into the COVID pandemic, and we're a bit inured now to the notion of COVID. But if I were to stand here and say to you, in 2025, there's going to be a disease that you've never heard of, which has a name, a sequence of letters that you've never put together before, that's going to come from nowhere and is going to become the third leading cause of death in 2025, right? You're sitting there thinking, well, we should do something about that. Like, we shouldn't let that happen, right? I mean, that's essentially what happened with COVID, right? Disease, sequence of letters, we've never heard of it, all of a sudden becomes the third leading cause of death in 2020. In 2020. That's, that's a pretty big deal. So the physical health consequences have been, a, have been a really big deal. A million people dying, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people's loved ones. You know, it's a lot of grandparents, a lot of parents, a lot of children, a lot of lovers, a lot of friends, a lot of people. And uh, so I think um, we, um, we will look back on this moment and say that we have lived through a, this sentinel pandemic of our time. Hopefully, hopefully for all of us in this room, it is the sentinel pandemic of our lifetimes. Um, because there will be other pandemics. The question is not if, the question is only when. Now, it hasn't just been COVID. Um, as COVID has moved along, we've had a higher death rate from all sorts of other things, complicated by the presence of COVID in multiple respects, both complicated from a pure biology point of view, as well as complicated from a point of view that we haven't been able to tend to other things. What this is looking at, this is actually a global picture. The black line down here is average mortality in the years 2015 to 2019. The red line is over here, you see in 2020, it, it jumps up here in March of 2020. This is mortality from everything else. You see how mortality from everything else has been much higher than it has been for the previous five years? And taking that and narrowing that down to the US, this looks at death from stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, hypertension. These are months. The blue line is the preceding five years, and this is deaths that we had in throughout 2020. And you see how each of these blue bars is higher than the dark blue line? That means that we've had higher deaths from all these other conditions that really are not nominally linked to COVID. They're not nominally, they have nothing to do with the viral pathogenesis, but they actually are linked to all the other things that actually are in our world around us that keep us healthy, allow us to access treatment, allow us to be in contact with, uh, with our social networks that can look after us, et cetera. So death has been higher from everything else in a time of COVID. And as a result, our, um, Life expectancy as a country has taken a hit. This is our life expectancy, and you see it's sort of a, there's a the significant hockey stick downturn life expectancy. We have had life expectancy downturns in the past um, decades, in, uh, most recently in 2016, 17, 18. But those life expectancy downturns generally are of the scale of about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 year downturn. This life expectancy downturn has been significantly higher, as I'm gonna show you in a second. It's been the largest life expectancy downturn we've had overall since 1918 flu pandemic, actually. Um, although there was also some big life expectancy downturns in younger age groups after World War, during World War II, when a lot of young people were sent off and died in war. Um, the health in the context of COVID has not been experienced equally. There's been enormous, enormous gaps by um, all sorts of different socioeconomic dimensions and also by race. This looks at um, mortality difference by race. Just look at the, the red. One is adjusted, one is unadjusted. The red is adjusted. And what you see is black Americans died about twice the rate of white Americans during COVID. When you look at the life expectancy overall now, there's a life expectancy decrease overall. On the left, you have the life expectancy decrease among black men, which is a three-year life expectancy decrease. That is an extraordinary life expectancy decrease. Like we have not had that since young people, young men in particular in World War II, where young men were, were dying in the hundreds of thousands. White women, life expectancy decrease is 0.7. Now, 0.7, now you look at this like this, and you're like, well, 0.7 is not very much compared to three. But again, just to remind us, we have never had, we haven't for a hundred years had a life expectancy drop that big. Like the, when we've had life expectancy drops in the past decades, it's been 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So 0 0.7 is already very big. Three is extraordinary. So it really has been a really substantial drop in life expectancy. There's been a substantial impact of COVID, and I don't think we, can, we, we should ever minimize that. Um, this looks at, um, and now even taking within race, this is talk, looking about um, um, black Americans, and what I wanna show you here is black Americans who test positive and black Americans who died, and this is by income. So what you see here is by income. So is, right, I showed you that black Americans died at twice the rate of white Americans, but if you focus on black Americans now, what you see is actually the death rate is much higher among people with low income than it is among people with high income. So this stratification, it's not so simple as saying it's by race. Yes, it's by race, but it's also by income. It's also by wealth. It's also by education. All these dimensions. I could, I, I could give you an hour talk showing you the 
different stratifications of acquiring COVID and severity of COVID by different social strata. So that's physical health. Let's talk about mental health. Mental, I'm not gonna talk about mental health, spend a little bit of time on it, both because I think it's, um, it's under discussed in the general public, but actually I think given what you all do, I think mental health really matters because I think mental health is gonna be one of the significant drivers of uh, disability that then actually is linked to uh, compensation and things like that. And I think mental health is, we're just beginning to discuss mental health in the society and we need to talk about it much more. So a traumatic event, this is the definition of a traumatic event. It's an experience that causes physical, emotional, psychological distress or harm. It's perceived as a threat to one's safety or stability of one's world. The reason I'm putting this up is because I'm hoping that you all look at this definition and you're like, yeah, that's the past two years, right? It's like, you don't need to be a trauma, a, a, a trauma scientist to look at that and say, that's exactly what the past two years have felt like. You know, we've had headlines like this, but you know, the, the fear of overdose deaths, the increase in um, 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 the death rate. And you know, I'm showing you the New York Times headline here, you know, the full caps, bold headline, when we hit 100,000 deaths. And the reason I'm showing you that is to, is to tell you how dramatic that was then. This is May, May 24, 2020. Now we're at a million deaths. So you know, just to really catch our breath and to say, this has been a really big deal. So mental health. Mental health has behaved accordingly. Broadly speaking, broadly speaking, the prevalence of mood anxiety disorders, depression and anxiety type disorders, which are the most common mental disorders, has gone up threefold in, um, um, from before COVID. And we've published papers that show that. And what's remarkable about that, it's not just that it's gone up threefold, is that we know, actually from a paper we just published a few weeks ago, that that increased prevalence stayed through the first year of COVID. So from March, 20, March April 2020 till March, April 2021, the increase of threefold in depression and anxiety stayed that high, which is really unusual. So when you see, when you have things like Hurricane Katrina, you have things like 9-11, we know that um, mental illness goes up. Typically what happens, it goes up, and after about six months, it's gone back down, getting back close to baseline. But in the context of COVID, it went up and stayed up. And it wasn't even among who actually had the burden of disease. So this looks at, uh, takes the uh, burden of depression, and breaks it into four groups. And what you have here is a fourfold difference between this group and that group. And who are these groups? This group is a group with high assets and low stressors. In other words, people who have a stable income, who weren't worried about their job, who had savings, and who weren't worried about their kids during COVID. This is the converse. People with unstable housing, no savings, worried about their kids, worried about looking after their parents, et cetera. Fourfold difference. That's an enormous difference. That's actually an enormous difference between people with assets and people without assets. And the, the burden of mental illness has been squarely fallen on people without assets, which, if you think back to what I said a few minutes ago, is also the same group that actually suffered the burden of um, physical consequence of COVID. So and a lot of the message of COVID, as you all sort of in your own minds organize what it means for what you do, organize for what it means for thinking about workplaces and the impact it's gonna have on workplaces. When I look at, this, at the data, there is no question that the impact is going to be borne more by people who are making less income, who are in less stable occupational structures. Those are the people who are gonna bear the brunt of this. Um, this looks, a, um, again, at um, the, uh, the dark blue line are people who actually had um, um, uh, exposed to financial stressors and the uh, hash line are people who didn't have financial stressors. And what you see is, and if you go this way, is you have more assets, like more savings, more home ownership, more assets, less depression. If you have financial stressors, you have higher burden of poor mental health at every level. By the way, this is the US, this is exactly, I'm showing you a slide from England just to show you it's exactly the same. There, you know, there hasn't been that much international data, but there's been some good uh, evidence from England, there's some evidence from Europe showing really exactly the same thing. Um, I, I wanna show you this. This is, um, looks at um, people who experience stressors in a time of COVID, and by stressors, you mean things like being worried about paying the rent, being worried about losing your job, being worried about your children. That's what stressors mean, okay? And um, there are two lines here. One is the brown line are people who don't have post-traumatic stress in the context of COVID, and the blue line are people who do have post-traumatic stress. I wanna show you two things. Number one, if you have post-traumatic stress, right, more stressors, the blue line is shifted to the right, which means you're more likely to have post-traumatic stress. But the other thing I wanna show you is that you have a lot of people out here under the brown line who have a lot of stressors. You see this here right here? Under the brown line, there's people with like four, five, six stressors who actually don't have post-traumatic stress. 
One of the challenges that we have in thinking about how mental illness affects people is we tend to think of mental illness dichotomously. Do you have post-traumatic stress? Yes or no. Do you have depression? Yes or no. But the message is there are a lot of people who don't meet diagnostic criteria who have a lot of symptoms. That has real implications for occupational performance. So we are seeing, and we're going to see more, more and more people whose actually occupational performance, whose, whose economic function, whose occupational function, whose social function is dipping, it's not as good as it was, who don't meet diagnostic criteria for mental illness. And that, I think, has real implications for the work that you all do. And I think one has to bear that in mind because you have an increase in symptoms overall a shift in the number of symptoms, even if people don't meet diagnostic criteria. And that's post-traumatic stress, and this, this shows you the same thing with um, depression and anxiety. Um, just to make the point again about um, who has more depression, um, this looks at stratification by income, by savings, home ownership, education, marital status. But what, what I want you to see here is that, you see here, the more income you have, less depression. More savings you have, less depression. Home ownership, the more likely, if you own a home, less likely to have depression. More education you have, less likely you are to have depression. This is a consistent finding across our work, across everybody's work, that it is people with less education, less income, less likely to own home, fewer savings. Those are the groups who are bearing the brunt of poor mental health in the context of COVID. Um, just a note that uh, this is from the um, uh, best study that has been done uh, uh, globally on this, uh, looking, uh, showing that uh, there has been an increase in um, COVID and in uh, apologies, in mental health in time of COVID, and in particular, because I didn't make this point otherwise, among women. So women, this is, this is um, the, um, the, the pink is uh, essentially the prevalence of uh, depression um, among women versus among men, and you see the rates are higher among women um, uh, consistently among young, both, both um, depression and anxiety disorders. So it's women, and particularly women who, are exper who have this sort of unstable, um, um, fewer savings, et cetera. And this looks around the world and looks at sort of the prevalences, but I'll skip that. This is, uh, actually, I want to show you this. Uh, this is a slide in Hong Kong. I actually put this in at the last minute because of what's going on in Ukraine with Russia right now. Because we are in a moment where, if you think back to my definition of traumatic event, we actually are going through another traumatic event right now with concern about war. So the question is, what does that mean? What does that do for, what does that do for thinking about the health of populations, particularly mental health of populations, particularly how that affects social occupational function, which is what you all are concerned about? Well. Uh, the news isn't good because the data suggests that actually these stressors and these traumas compound one another. And this is from Hong Kong. This was, this was a study that um, our group was able to do that looked at uh, the uprisings in Hong Kong. You may remember they had the umbrella uprisings that actually coincided with the first year of COVID. And very simply, what this graph shows is, um, again, the, the white bar are people with, with uh, more assets. The red bar are people with, um, uh, with fewer assets. So red is always more than white. But over here, are people who actually experienced more stressors from the multiple traumas. So multiple traumas compound. Sometimes you see in the popular conversation that says things like, well, you know, if you have a trauma, it inoculates you, you're stronger from, for, for other events. It's actually not true. More trauma is worse than less trauma. And the more trauma you have, it's worse than more trauma. It's like, so, so the context of right now that's going on with war and threat of war, that's actually really terrible. It's terrible, I mean, it's terrible in Ukraine, terrible in what's going on there, but it's also terrible for our mental health here, and particularly people who already had experienced poor mental health in the context of COVID. Um, and this looks at drug overdose. I, 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 um, there's been an increase in drug use throughout the country. There's been an increase in alcohol use throughout the country. Manifests more centrally in the context of 93,000 people died from overdose in uh, 2020 alone. From March of 2020 till March of 2021, 100,000 people died from drug overdose, which is, by the way, a 30% increase over the previous year. We had, um, in the opioid epidemic, we were actually trending down before COVID. We were actually were turning the corner in the opioid epidemic, um, but we increased mortality again by about 30%. A lot of that driven, of course, by poor mental health, loneliness, isolation, as well as the ready availability of synthetic powerful opioids. Um, um, this is um, the, 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 again, just to show you this one, this people uh, who actually talk about saying worry or stress has a negative impact on their mental health. And I want to show you again, people with making less than $40,000 a year, people making more than $90,000 a year, who say they have, has an impact. And even in self-report, people who make less money know that this has had more impact. And then one last point about um, essential workers and essential workers um, versus non-essential workers. Essential workers, more anxiety disorder than non-essential workers, more substance use, more likely to consider suicide. So essential workers 
those who have actually been at the front lines, of those who haven't had the luxury of working from home, that's where the burden of poor mental health, mental health is. And as I'm gonna to get to long COVID, by the way, that has real implications for how we think about long COVID. Okay, so now let's talk about where we're headed. You know, I, I, I said to you at the beginning that anybody who makes predictions is going to be wrong. Now I enter my prediction phase and I'm doing that because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know you want me to make predictions, so I'm, I'm gonna make predictions, but with a very strong caveat right at the beginning. Um, let me start with, uh, oops, I apologize, I skipped this. Let me start with this, uh, with this quote, which I actually really like. Um, this is from uh, Professor Alan Brand, who says, we tend to think of pandemics, epidemics as episodic, but we're actually living in a COVID-19 era, not the COVID-19 crisis. There'll be a lot of changes that are substantial and persistent. We won't look back and say, that was a terrible time, but it's over. We'll be dealing with many of the ramifications of COVID-19 for decades. So I agree with that completely. I actually think that uh, while we may be emerging from the acute phase, where we are making changes to our daily life, sort of seemingly daily, right? You're like, are things changing? Is there a new variant? I think we'll emerge from that phase. We will emerge from that phase. But these long tail implications, particularly the long tail mental health implications, long term, long tail physical health implications, and the long tail implications for recognizing that maybe other pandemics are gonna be with us for decades, for most of us in this room, for the rest of our working lives. Like we're gonna be feeling these long term implications for, for the coming several decades. So let's talk about health trajectories. Well, I'll start with the good news. You know, the good news is things do get better in terms of health. We know this. This is, you know, I mentioned how the uh, burden of depression has gone up threefold, and, but, uh, and it stayed up for the first year, but it will go down. Like, it will go down. Um, um, we know this from other studies. This is uh, previous work shows, you know, you have um, increase in mental health after something really bad traumatic event. Eventually, it goes down. Again, increase, and eventually it goes down. So things will go down. The question is when it will go down. We actually have some studies in the field right now looking at where the burden of um, depression is now. We don't have the data yet. I would expect that the data is going to show that we're down from the threefold increase that we had over the course of the first uh, year, year and a half of COVID, but we'll see. Let's talk about social costs. This is global GDP projections. Um, um, the blue line is um, where the projection was in October of um, 2019. Um, where you can see sort of, you know, where global GDP production is going up, and then October 20 had this enormous jolt, right? We, the, the world has never really had a jolt like that in terms of uh, the GDP production. So it was revised in uh, April of 21, saying things are a little bit better. Of course, that was before there was anything like the threat of war like we're dealing with right now in uh, Ukraine to color the picture. So, so th these will be long tail implications of what's going on with COVID. Um, and uh, we're seeing more and more, this is working our loss by income group, and this looks at uh, 2020, the different quarters in 2020, and looks at uh, low income countries all the way to high income countries, and really to show substantial loss in working hours across all occupations all over the world, which of course is what accounts then for the loss in GDP, and what ultimately accounts for how one deals with these occupational costs that I know you're concerned about. Okay, the scope of occupational costs. Well, I mean, there, there, there are really, very little good data on this. There's some early data from 2020 about occupational um, um, uh, losses. This 2020, about uh, 45,000 claims, 260 million in losses. Almost all the losses are lost time, people with COVID who actually cannot work. That's broadly speaking what uh, we're seeing around the world. Um, amazingly, the uh, claim counts mirror the ep epidemic curves. Remember the, ep the epidemic curve I showed you at the beginning? Claim counts mirror the epidemic curve. So broadly speaking, what's been happening in the world is you have more cases of COVID, more people can't work, you have more claims for lost time, which of course has real implications for how we deal with future variants. It has real implications for uh, um, uh, how we deal with the next variant as to the extent to which that results in us shutting down or it results in us not even shutting down, but actually elevating the visibility of COVID, which then results in uh, occupational losses. Interestingly, the COVID-19 claim count varies tremendously by state, like it really varies tremendously by state. Um, the median by state is about seven, eight percent. But what you see states like Kentucky and Minnesota are much, much more than uh, states like Alabama and um, you know, Vermont. It's actually like the difference here is this is 30 percent all the way to five percent. There is a, that's a six fold difference. It's actually quite interesting that uh, how much things vary by state, which when you think about it, that probably doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense from a, uh, from a pure disease pathology point of view, right? It only makes sense from a cultural point of view. It only makes sense from a cultural, legal, structural point of view. Um, and this shows you again what I showed you before, that 75% of claims are lost time claims, um, um, and with some mix of indemnity only and some indemnity in medical. 
Um, the size of losses in 2020 have been small, um, mostly because loss time has actually been small. Of course, we're now entering a different phase. We're now entering the long-term phase and where things like long COVID may end up being with much more lost time. And that's something which I know is on everybody's mind. And in terms of industry, um, uh, most of the claims have been from uh, nursing, convalescent homes, and other healthcare, which of course makes sense. It makes sense, and I map that onto what I showed you earlier. Remember the essential workers? Remember the essential workers having higher burden of poor mental health? That maps onto this. Like those two pieces definitely come together. Um, and uh, this is what the, the, the three biggest drivers of costs have been for insurers have been lifetime medical insurance, permanent disability benefits, and death benefits. Now, let me, as I conclude in the next uh, 10 minutes, let me talk about long COVID, because I, wanna, uh, I know that long COVID is important, important for you all, and something that we're all thinking about. So the first question, how frequent, uh, you know, how common is long COVID and how common is it going to be? To which I will give you the confident answer, we don't know. Um, uh, so this is, this is the best review out there about long COVID. Um, uh, and what this looks at is, um, uh, essentially the, uh, how, frequent, how frequent long COVID is per case of COVID. And the reason I'm showing you this is to show you the enormous variability that we have in the studies, going from 80% to about 9%. I mean, the middle is about 30, 40%, but you have to be very careful because of what that means and what time point long co we're measuring long COVID. A more better way of looking at it is like this. This looks at the, how length, how much long, uh, what the length of time that the study was following people forward in, uh, in terms of uh, looking at long COVID, and this is the frequency. So long COVID, by the way, the formal name is post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, PASC. And what you see is the studies that are longer out, they actually have lower burden. As you can see there's a general best fit line like this, right? So it makes sense that the studies that, do, that look at a shorter window find a higher burden of, uh, uh, of uh, long COVID than the studies that actually look at longer window, they find a lower burden. So that all makes sense. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'll give you my best read of the literature. We're going to end up with something less than 10% in terms of long COVID that actually has, has significant social economic impact. At the end of the day, these numbers will go down because what you actually see, and we know, we know this from studies after other diseases, early on, early on, you have these studies and they elevate the prevalence of these of these conditions because you're actually sampling a lot of people actually have these conditions, but as you, as time passes, you're looking at the whole populations and the burden goes down. We will end up with something that's less than 10%. Now, symptoms, so what's happening with long COVID? Well, here's the burden of symptoms. Most of it is fatigue. The most common symptoms is fatigue, things like shortness of breath. You know, you've all heard of things like loss of smell, et cetera. Those are sort of, you know, headline grabbers, but they're actually relatively uncommon. Um, the, the problem with fatigue, as you all know, is that, um, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to uh, quantify, very hard to define. And the other thing is that we, we should all be clear, because, you know, we've talked about long COVID almost as though it's this unusual unicorn. You know, there's long flu as well. We never talk about long flu. Like all, all viral infections are associated with long-term sequelae of some sort or another in some proportion of people. And the worse they are, the more the long-term sequelae. So the fact that there is this long COVID is not at all surprising. The question, of course, I think for the scientific community, I think relevant to you on a practical basis, is how one rationalizes that and how one quantifies that and how one can create some lines between this is long COVID and this is not long COVID. Um, one of the things that, is, that we know is that the symptoms, is that long COVID symptoms are, for example, relatively similar to what they are for things like influenza. So this looks at actually the correlation, the, the, the way to read these squares is the darker the square, the more two things go together. So, you know, throat pain, um, <coughs> fatigue, et cetera, in long COVID, all of these symptoms that I just showed you, they also are the same symptoms with, uh, with um, influenza. So flu, the, the symptoms of long COVID are very similar to the symptoms of flu and the symptoms of long flu. And so we need to think of it this way. The big difference, of course, is that there have been a lot of people who've had COVID at the same time. And COVID has entered the system almost like a bolus, right, which didn't happen before. I mean, flu was there all the time. I mean, it varied from year to year. But it, as it varied from year to year, now all of a sudden we have a big bolus of COVID. Um, the, um, you know, the limits to daily life of uh, people with long COVID, this is probably the best summary there is out there. You know, most people who actually end up with long COVID, who have symptoms of COVID that are, again, principally fatigue, the vast majority say they have limitations of daily function, like 82% of them have limitations of daily function. A couple of comments about duration, um, um, and uh, this looks at um, three different colors. 
Um, this is one to 90 days, 90 to 180 days, and then it's more sort of a beyond, um, beyond that. And what you see is um, uh, any symptoms is over here. Um, this is one to 90 days, this is 90 to 180 days, this is beyond 180 days. But if you look at fatigue, for example, right? So you have, you see right here, it's about, what is it, 15%? If you look at most of these, when you're dealing with 180 days plus, you're dealing in the under, under around 10% range. And, and I actually think that these data are converging, that we're seeing that this will be around 10% or under 10%. Um, uh, and uh, this looks at um, um, uh, COVID symptoms among outpatients. The light blue is you actually had the symptom originally, and the dark blue is unresolved when you actually had um, follow-up in outpatient care um, uh, three months later. And what you see, look at things like fatigue. So a lot of people have it originally when first diagnosed, and then three months later, it goes down quite a bit, right? So these data are beginning to emerge. I mean, th this paper was just published like two weeks ago. So all these data are really just beginning to emerge. Um, and then one last thing, this looks at uh, comparing um, the uh, post-COVID functional status among people with acute COVID and long COVID symptoms. This is um, the light orange is acute COVID. The um, orange is long COVID. And what you see is in long COVID, you have, you have uh, um, um, more people with slight functional limitations than people with acute COVID. Let me talk about treatment and then I'll start winding down. So treatment for uh, long COVID, this is all still emerging. Um, uh, there are support groups, there's trial self-management, definitive treatment is still underway. There's some studies, the most active studies right now are using antihistamines, things like we actually use for allergy right, as well, which reflects the underlying co-occurring mechanisms of allergic and infectious um, um, reactions. Disability, I mean, long COVID result, disability, it's sort of, um, it uh, ultimately ends up being um, covered by uh, the Obamacare Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. Um, it has to limit more, one or more major life activity. And um, th th they're increasingly employers now asking for provision of proof and loss of disability. This is from a Social Security Administration website, which actually I'm just showing you to just show you the utter complexity of this at the moment, as the whole world tries to figure out exactly how to deal with it. I mean, this is intended, you know, this is intended for the patient if you have long COVID. I would argue if you have long COVID, you're actually not going to spend your time working your way through that. Um, uh, but that's, that's, I sort of found that very amusing. I'm like, if this is meant to help me if I'm fatigued from long COVID, it's not going to help me. Um, you know, just to give a sense that this, this is sort of emerging. And just to conclude with, um, in terms of employers, I mean, what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing more and more employers doing post-COVID-19 recovery programs, disability leave programs, behavioral health support. Behavioral health support, is, I think, is becoming more and more important because of the correlation that is emerging between mental health and long COVID, between um, depression and anxiety and long COVID. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip that. But you know, in terms of mental health coverage, there's a whole range right, of through workman's comp, group health insurance, wellness programs, but more and more large employers certainly are, I think, investing wisely their time in actually doing intra-employer um, mental health assistance, which I think makes sense. And I actually think it's a very reasonable investment, particularly in the long term, not just in terms of COVID, but also in terms of the long-term consequences of COVID-19. Um, the use of telemedicine and uh, the use of telework options. One of the, there's no question that telemedicine is going to uh, um, grow much more on this, uh, in, 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 uh, in the world. It's gonna be, you know, grow a little bit like in baby steps and stumbling along like a toddler. Um, and there's also the option then of people teleworking. The, the challenge with all of these is that they are tremendously, tremendously heterogeneously distributed, that people with uh, more advanced degrees have more access to these resources, people with higher income have more access to these resources. And remember, remember what I've shown you consistently throughout, that people with actually lower education levels, less income are the ones who are, have, are carrying the burden of disease. So again, this goes back to my inverse care law option, that in so far as being able to continue high occupational functioning facilitated by teleworking, well, the people who are able to benefit from that are people who least need it. So we have a bit of a paradox in our society, and I think actually some of that has real implications for thinking about programs that we may put in place to mitigate the consequences of long COVID. And then this is um, just a front paper that came out in, in the, that uh, really just looks at, we can't forget that the sequelae of COVID and long COVID are associated with the world around us. Um, this talks about economic, housing, substance use, healthcare, all of which ultimately affects long COVID. And data are beginning to emerge on this. This is actually the only paper I could find as I did a thorough scan of the, of the literature ahead of this talk, looking at things like education and race associated with long COVID. And what you see here is that low education is associated with five-fold greater risk of long COVID if you've had COVID 
um, black Americans versus white Americans fivefold um, increase as well. So what we're seeing is right, these same patterns that we saw with COVID, that the groups who are at disadvantage are the ones who are more likely than to have long COVID if they've had COVID. And the pattern is beginning to replicate itself. This is really the only paper that I know of that exists right now. Um, let me conclude, just a big picture very quickly. You know, one can't forget that uh, all of this ultimately is part of the larger construct of people's lives. One of the mistakes that we've made in the context of COVID is to think that the solution to COVID is all about vaccines, that it's all about the virus. Actually, it is about the virus, but the virus is only a small part of what matters, is healthcare. You know, whether people are smoking or drinking or using alcohol, where they live, their education, their job status, family support, all of that matters enormously in terms of people's function, people's ability to um, live through COVID and move on beyond COVID. You know, how people's circumstances of their lives ultimately shaped their risk of getting COVID, their risk of severe COVID, and will be shaping their risk of long COVID in the long term. This is the book that um, I just wrote in, uh, that came out in November, which actually talks, talks about uh, a number of these things. It doesn't touch on long COVID, but it talks about the, um, ultimately the circumstances in the world around us that create health and why people are healthy or not healthy in the context of COVID. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for having me. I'll look forward to questions. There are two mics. Please come up to the mic. I've been asked to ask you to state your name and where you're from for, so everybody knows who you are. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Kearney. I'm with uh, AF Group. And uh, Dr. Dooley, I have to say that was a, a very insightful uh, you know, presentation. Thank you. So one of your earlier slides noted that um, over 80% of all Americans over the age of five uh, have been vaccinated here in America. And what I'm wondering is, you know, we've heard about the, the concept of uh, herd immunity. Um, are we close to achieving herd immunity? And if we are, what does that you know, truly mean yep. with regards to the rate of uh, transmissions, yep. the rate of infection uh, you know, for the future? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, um, <laughs> you know, the term herd immunity now, we're, we're, uh, it seems like the world's moving towards the term population immunity because people don't like the word herd, but it is in May. It's the same concept. Um, the best estimates right now is that we have 95% herd immunity, that uh, through a combination of vaccines and having acquired COVID, that 95% of us have some immunity to COVID. That's very good news. That's really good news. Because you know, the next part of your question is, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that we are less likely to actually get COVID. It doesn't mean we're not going to get COVID, because we know that. We know that, uh, particularly in Omicron, we know that people who have been vaccinated have gotten COVID. But what it does mean is that it is unlikely, there's another reason why it's unlikely that if we get COVID, it's going to be as severe, right? So I mentioned earlier the evolutionary reason why the virus is not likely to be as severe, but there's another reason why our experience of the virus is not likely to be as severe, which is herd immunity. Because if we all, it's about 95% is the best estimate. I think most scientists would agree that's probably about right right now. That number means that even if there's a virus, which is by its, in and of itself, we expect it to be less severe, it's combined with the fact that there's more immunity, which means that people are less likely to experience it in a severe way. So that is all good news in terms of looking ahead in the next six months to a year. Thank you. Uh, Gary Anderberg, I'm the publisher of the Gallagher Bassett Journal. Uh, I read a couple of press reports just recently, and these are only press reports, uh, of a chronic cardiac problem, sometimes referred to as cardiac insufficiency, being associated with COVID, not necessarily limited to long COVID. Now, obviously, for those of us in the workers' compensation business, any lingering disability, as you've noted uh, yes. earlier, is of considerable interest. So uh, do you have any information on that? Can you comment on that? Thank yeah, you. my comment is um, unsatisfactory because only to say, yes, those cases have been reported. The, um, I don't know of any evidence that that is, um, that, that, that is in any way a high prevalence as to be significant at the population level. It doesn't mean it's not going to be there. There's a form of cardiomyopathy that results in the, which is essentially inflammation of the heart muscle. Cardiomyopathy means the heart muscle gets inflamed, which if you think about it, isn't so crazy. It makes sense, right? You have a general immunity um, infection and inflames the heart muscle. There are cases, but I haven't seen any evidence that it rises to population level concern. It doesn't mean that some of you won't be dealing with that in workman's comp, but, uh, but I, I haven't seen any evidence that it's, like it's not at a 1%, 5%, 10% level, which says you're all going to be dealing with it. Long COVID, you're all going to be dealing with. Like it's, we're dealing with 10%, it means everybody's dealing with it. But these cardiac cases, I think, from what I've seen right now, they're rare. 
You were. He was there. Go ahead. Seems like you were first, sir. Okay. Hi, uh, Craig Ross. Uh, I'm medical director at Liberty Mutual. Uh, first, thanks for a great presentation. Um, and uh, I'd like to follow up on a point you made and quite frankly, a point I neglected to make yesterday. I was on the panel yesterday. So you pointed out that um, uh, opioid overdoses are up uh, and are the highest they've been uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, Anecdotally, I, I don't think that we've seen overdoses increase in the workers' comp line of business. Uh, however, um, the CDC is reworking their guidelines uh, on opioids for the treatment of chronic pain to remove some of the speed bumps that are there um, at the request of pain management physicians and, and, and their patients. Um, and that draft guideline is uh, up for public comment, and I'd uh, encourage anyone who's involved in the treatment of injured workers to have a look at that draft, and if they feel so moved, uh, you know, issue some comment. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, it's not a question, so I'm not going to address it. I think it's, a, it, it's an excellent point. I just want to make the point that uh, this ties in a little bit. Remember earlier when I was saying you know, it's going to be the new variant, the BA2, and um, the, the biology is only a very small part in terms of how we react to things. You know, I think the, the story of overdose is a good example of this. Like the increase in overdose, the increases in mental health are a direct result of our approach to dealing with COVID. And we as a society need to get better at the trade-offs inherent in that. There are trade-offs, like by, by creating isolation, by limiting people working by, by themselves at home, um, we are creating more opportunities for depression, for anxiety, for drug overdose. And, and we need to be aware of that as a society. And we have been terrible at that as a society, like in the past couple of years. We've been terrible. We've been clumsy at that. Hi, I'm Michelle Adams, and I lead the workers' compensation organization with Walmart. Thank you so much. This is, there's so much here. I just want to go back and read it all again. Um, I have two questions. Number one, I think it was slide 17 on the first part of your, of your presentation. You talked about um, the forecasting versus reality. And I'm curious, are we getting any better? And is that consistent with other um, you know, viruses, yeah. flu? And then the second question um, has to do with the, um, you laid out the states and the workers' compensation claims the prevalence of COVID-19, did you overlay anything with um, states that have presumption? And I'm not sure if that's something that you you have dug into, but it would seem that if you have a presumption of coverage, then mm -hmm. you would have a more likely occurrence of reporting. Um, and so I'm just curious yeah. of whether the, the data um, was delineated in that fashion. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific question. So let me start um, backwards. I, I actually, I, I don't know that the data has been mapped on to presumption of coverage, but, uh, but obviously one can do that. I, I haven't done that, but that's, that's entirely doable. The data on the state level data on um, um, the variability in the workman's compensation claims is available and one can do that, number one. Number two, um, I will comment on the fact you said you were at workman's compensation at Walmart. It's, um, you know, hats off because you, you'll be, you can be dealing with a lot of these issues, right? Given, given your, your, um, the large number of people across many states and particularly given the um, heterogeneous uh, wage profile of people that you're dealing with, it's a, a lot of this has direct implications for uh, companies like yours, for very large companies like that. In terms of prediction, um, the CDC just started a unit about uh, three months ago. Which, is, uh, which actually they took um, um, a number of academics from universities, which is specifically um, targeted around prediction, trying to make prediction better. You asked me, are we better? And my answer is, not yet. Um, um, I hope we are. We actually um, um, uh, are hosting an event at uh, our school in a couple of weeks, looking at some of these questions about prediction as well. I mean, it's, it's a real open question. I, I don't think we're better yet, but there are efforts being made to try to make it better. Good morning, doctor. I'm Paul Signolfi, and I'm with Amitros. Good morning. I have a simple question. Um, I read about pandemics as a result of COVID, and what my reading tells me that there are always big lessons that we learn from having experienced a pandemic, and there are some positives. What are the big lessons, and what are the positives that COVID has left will leave us with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate the question. 
the, um, I, I think if we don't learn from COVID, we are really dishonoring the moment. And um, so I think it's on us to learn, to learn from COVID. So I, I will tell you my three big learnings. Number one, we should learn that a pandemic doesn't create health. Like pandemic reflects underlying health. A large part of the reason, and you know, I could give a separate talk to make this point, a large part of the reason why COVID had such devastating consequences for this country is because our underlying health was much worse than it could have been. We have worse health, we live shorter, sicker lives as a country than do other high income countries, despite the fact that we spend a lot more on health. And that is why COVID ravaged us in terms of much more than any other country in terms of both absolute number of cases and per, per capita cases. So number one, what matters to be ready for the next pandemic is to have underlying good health to begin with. They were actually healthy to begin with. Number two is that a lot of our handling of a um, pandemic like this requires good communication and aligned political forces. And we dealt with COVID completely opposite way, right? Like we had complete fracturing, social fracturing around the time COVID emerged and really terrible communication around it. And, and we realized that we can, there's no solution to dealing with pandemic unless you have aligned politics and unless you have a unified front against a common enemy. If you think about it, a novel virus should be something that brings us together, right? It's a common enemy. But in fact, it had the opposite to really split the country apart. And number three is that we were woefully underprepared in terms of our public health systems. You know, you know what percent of health departments actually have an epidemiologist? It's about 23%. But 23% of health departments across the country actually have an epidemiologist on staff. I mean, that's just to give you one sense. Most states spend less than $100 a person on public health. So we actually didn't have the systems in place. You know, when COVID hit, the concept of testing and tracing, which is sort of a, you know, epidemiology 101 for how to deal with pandemics, we simply could not do that. Like, it was, it was way outside the scope of what we were ready to do as a country. So number one, we need to invest in health before the next pandemic. Number two, we need better public health infrastructure. And number three, we need to make sure that we actually have a politics aligned with thinking of these things as being nonpartisan and moving us forward in the right direction. Sir. Yes, my name is Charles Herring. I'm a chiropractor from Louisiana. And I just had this kind of question that I think is interesting to me, may not be to anybody else. Is natural immunity helping people better defend against the variants versus the uh, immunization process? Yeah, no one knows. It's, a, it's an excellent question, but there, there are no good data. That is, ties a little bit with the, with the herd immunity question. And actually, if we knew that answer, it would help answer the herd immunity question a little bit better, because then we can say, look, 95% of people have herd immunity, a certain proportion of them have had vaccines, a certain proportion of them had had the infection, but we actually don't know. We'll know in time. That's the kind of thing that actually is empirically knowable. We just don't have the data on it right now. Well, I see we're at the end of our time. Thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.